This okay, conference will now be recorded. <laughs> Apologies for that. In case you were wondering, we're recording our webinar. Um, I'm just checking to see if I can move from to the next slide. Excuse me while we just solve this technical for a moment. Beryl, would you like to introduce yourself while we're just um, ensuring? Um, this is Beryl. Can everybody hear me? This is a pre-speaking voice check. We can hear Yes, you. we can hear you. Great. Okay, now I'll do something that's harder than that. I'll try not to speak until it's my turn. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Beryl. It's good to know you're there. Um, so as I was just explaining, um, we now have some lovely slides and um, this is going to be the pattern for our webinar. And Beryl and I are going to attempt to not speak too much, to make sure there's a lot of time for dialogue with those of you on the call. So to get us started, um, I wanted to highlight, uh, Suziwe has already hinted at some of this, but I wanted to highlight that the AN is very committed to working together towards enabling in fact, we, we firmly believe that it's only by doing this work together that, that anything um, will change and that we can see an increase in the use of evidence for decision making. As a network, we don't run training um, ourselves. What we do do is facilitate others to share the kinds of capacity development work they're doing, whether it's formal training courses or workshops or webinars or other types of initiative. So we have a number of platforms where we're sharing others' resources and others' initiatives, and also where we're aiming to take forward the debates and the dialogues in this space. So we, for example, have a new database of resources that you can search online. In fact, it's being updated at the moment, so the new version will come soon. But that enables you to both share the kinds of capacity development initiatives that you might be running and also to access those of others. And then we have this secondary piece around um, facilitating dialogue and discussion and helping to move these debates forward. And I'm going to pass across to Beryl to explain a little around the history of this conversation. Right, thanks, Ruth. So just very quickly, um, these dialogues grew out of a question that uh, staff in 3IU started asking in 2016-17 as we realized that our role in building capacity was growing and that we were starting to diversify uh, our approaches to how we met needs, specifically within impact evaluations and, and systematic reviews but very much uh, in the area of increasing use of that evidence. So in Kampala at uh, 2017, we decided to just have a very informal get together of interested people who wanted to share their experiences uh, for good or, or frustration in the types of training and capacity uh, building as it was commonly referred to was taking place. So Deo Gracias uh, Hundolo, who's a 3IE colleague based in Benin, is part of developing what's called the West African Impact Evaluation uh, Capacity Building Initiative. And so we learned from that initial small conversation that all was not well in, uh, in, in how the users of capacity development were perceiving the, the capacity that they were receiving. So we then decided, uh, the Ruth Stewart was at this meeting, we all decided that at the Global Evidence Summit in Cape Town, we would broaden and, uh, that dialogue and uh, advertise it a lot more. And we asked CLEAR, AA, JPAL, um, and SEGA, and uh, African Evidence Network and ourselves to sit together and, uh, and about 30 people continued that conversation about what was working and, and what wasn't and answering a question that we put to the group, which was, you know, when somebody says capacity development, what makes you see red? What is it that you really hate? Like, like for me, it is PowerPoint driven workshops um, that are supposed to be training people. Uh, this is one example. And then in Pretoria last September, some of you may have remembered that we thought, well, we're just going to keep asking questions and providing an opportunity for people to tell us what they're thinking about what's working and not. And we heard um, 
input from new voices joining the conversation. Uh, we had people from INAS, which specializes in adult learning approaches, DPME, uh, CLEAR, AFREA, and others uh, contributing what they were doing and why, um, and using these as a platform to be able to, to start to do more of what Ruth alluded to, which is by communicating better about what we were all doing and sharing what we were was frustrating us and not, we started to feel an energy that together we could actually start to be more articulate and be able to take forward some of these ideas about working better together. So that's the short history. Um, and over to Ruth now to recap uh, some of the some of the types of frustrations that probably will resonate with a lot of you and we'll probably hear about those and, and some new ones uh, later on in the open discussion. Ruth? Thank you very much, Beryl. Um, I am just moving on to the next slide. We seem to have a problem with scrolling our slides a little bit today, so sorry about this. I'm going to find that function. So, Beryl, a little bit of a history of um, why we're here and where we've got up to. And um, the, the next uh, slide is really to explain um, some of those things that uh, make us see red. Those of you who are in Evidence 2018 in Pretoria will remember we had a, a flash mob dancing and um, hence these, these images on these slides. But I thought this was a nice way of helping us to think of seeing red. Um, so there are a number of issues in this space. And I think those of us who've been doing capacity development of various kinds will be familiar with a lot of these. These are things that um, 3IE and Beryl have, have been raising for a number of uh, years now, as have many of our partners across Africa. And these, these issues have all come up in these dialogues that we've had at these events. So um, the first one really is around whose agenda is uh, a lot of the capacity development initiatives meeting. And there's a feeling that a lot of these agendas and priorities are being driven by funders rather than actual needs on the ground. And, and actually sometimes worse than that, I think it's, it's almost a tick box activity. So there might be a, an international donor who's doing some work um, within the continent and they've been asked to do some capacity building whilst they're there. And, and that will be a very much a tick box act activity that might only include a small number of people and may, may be purely to keep those funders happy. And again, linked to that, they're often short term approaches. So it's rare to find a really integrated program for capacity development that spans a, a, a decent period of time, even though we know that you need that kind of length of time and engagement and, and a depth to actually make a difference. Um, there's a tendency, and again, I think it's partly linked to funders and what pushes their buttons and gets them excited. There's a tendency to have um, training capacity development initiatives provided by big name institutions and by staff from the global north. And I should add that this isn't um, a criticism, it isn't solely a criticism because we all feed into this. So we like to say that we have a degree from Oxford or Cambridge in the UK or that we studied in Harvard, etc. So the, the names come with a kudos and a weight. And I think one of the, the red flags that we've had is that, that the capacity development needs to be deeper than that and more appropriate than that. And a big name is not sufficient. We've also highlighted um, an emphasis on uh, capacity development for policymakers. So I ran one of the DFID funded BCure programs, building capacity to use research evidence um, for a few years based here in Johannesburg. And it was highlighted very early on that actually that was based on a deficit model that assumes that it's the policymakers who are lacking in capacity and need support. And it was very clear to us very early on that actually, as researchers working in a university, we had far poorer understanding of the policymaking process than our policymaker colleagues had of the research process. So there are some assumptions around where, what capacity needs to be developed. These dialogues have also highlighted this lack of adaptation to local contexts and lack of understanding of what's needed in a local context and what gains traction. Um, and I think that's coupled with a limited use of adult learning approaches, um, despite the fact that we know quite a lot of 
for adult learning. Um, the, the, that doesn't seem to be reflected in this capacity development work for its use. I think something that affects my work on a pretty much a daily basis is around the way that we're set up in these initiatives and the way that they're funded to work in competition and not in collaboration. And we're, um, we're really pleased as part of an Africa-wide network to be emphasizing collaboration and able to host dialogues like this where we say we want to learn together and move forwards together and this isn't about me saying to Beryl in, in Delhi with 3IE or to anybody else engaged in this webinar that I, what I do is better and that I want to um, learn from you so that I can win the bid. This is about uh, trying to move forwards together. But unfortunately, so often in this space, particularly where there's funding available and that it's limited, there's a lot of competition instead of that kind of collaborative approach that we suspect is much more constructive when it comes to capacity development. And then last but not least, we know about great initiatives across the region. Um, people are investing and they're doing their best to avoid these things. They're investing in long term programs. They're uh, considering local agendas and local contexts and working hard to meet genuine capacity needs in appropriate ways. And I think sometimes the great lessons that are coming from those initiatives are not being um, shared or given the profile that perhaps they need. I'm going to uh, pass back to Beryl now so that we can start to think about how we move forwards. Um, and Beryl, I see there's a, a message that says that some people are struggling to hear you a little bit. So if you have a chance to just speak up slightly, that would be great. You might be muted, Beryl. Okay, uh, now I'm not muted, but that might not address the problem either. But I'm gonna adjust my volume on this end. Uh, hopefully that's better. Um, Okay, I'll try. Um, okay, so essentially, I just want to amplify a few points from uh, Bruce's excellent overview of um, sort of what a description of the landscape as we know it, um, but that but that also celebrating that it's not all about just problems. That there is some really innovative um, and exciting and collaborative in many ways uh, work that's going on. It's how to break down the silos around it. Uh, so, for example, the Beaker, Diffid Beaker uh, regional project, which involved uh, the University of Joburg, as, as uh, Ruth was mentioning, AFIDEP, uh, INASP, and ODI joined uh, to work with uh, African governments in Ghana and South Africa and uh, Malawi, I think. I'm not sure. But anyway that uh, bringing different approaches to how to improve uh, decision makers use of evidence. So that seems to be the holy grail um, in our world. And each of these approaches had a benefit. And there's actually a very useful report uh, from BCure about lessons from BCure and what worked. But what's fascinating is, is that that report um, is not widely uh, known to a lot of people. And the lessons from that major initiative, which also has just fed DFID's coming up with uh, a variation on the program, not a literal phase two, but uh, having learned lessons from BCure, now DFID wants to fund more uh, capacity development uh, for decision makers to use evidence. And so we will be seeing the uh, fruits of the, these lessons, but it's in another DFID project. You know, so this goes to the, is it, is it really widely accessible to everybody? Uh, why not? Why are there not better communication plans around what's going on and collaboration um, within these large projects? How can we overcome that if, if it is about to give more money in the region uh, for this type of work? These are questions that, that we all have, even those of us who are involved in this type of work on an ongoing basis. So. How do we emphasize the, the lessons of co-production, co-creation, mutual respect, learning that uh, we speak different languages as researchers, producers, and intermediaries, and users, and that it's all, um, these are many hats that we can wear at the same time. They're, they're not uh, easily separated out uh, for the benefit of project log frames and, and things like that. 
But another thing that's emerging from what we're hearing from the conferences, this was coming out at Evidence 2018 in a wonderful way. The Prime Minister of Uganda just spoke to the Uganda Evaluation Association uh, Evidence Week participants last week and, and called upon all of us to realize that evidence use is a right uh, and a need of everyone, not just the power holders in government, and that we are making a mistake to focus exclusively or mostly on policymakers. And the efforts that we're hearing about, IDRC had a great session at Evidence 2018 on um, citizen uh, evidence production and use, and we're hearing more about public engagement for transparency and accountability. 3IE and the World Bank are going to be co-hosting a conference in uh, a one-day conference in April in Washington, D.C. to talk about these types of efforts. But it's this idea of uh, going beyond the, the known power centers that the funders care about and putting evidence in the right form at the right time in the right way as we're learning as evidence, um, people who, who spend our time promoting evidence use, but in the hands of uh, citizens, of parliamentarians, and, uh, and working with the media in new and exciting ways to value hearing more from those people specialized in knowledge translation techniques using adult learning approaches. We heard about that uh, in a session at the, at the Evidence 2018 conference. So, and these ideas of rapid responses where people can have questions and need evidence and need to be able to get at it um, quickly and, and effectively, especially parliament and government users are talking a lot more now about, it's not just how to use it, it's that we can't access it. Or if we can access it, we can't, it's not in the right form for us to use quickly. It's still not there at the right time in the right ways. So really now to move us on uh, to, to the next se uh, sec section, sorry, um, which is uh, the whoever's controlling the slides, we can move on to the next slide, uh, number five because this is where uh, the conversation really can become exciting. And that is that Ruth and I would like to, to uh, welcome the audience, all of you um, who've been uh, patiently listening to us to tell us about what's resonating from our quick overview, which is designed not really mostly to just stimulate thinking and, and hopefully feedback but we have some questions uh, that we're trying to, to put forward, but um, with this idea, if we, if we wanted to move now from these dialogues of what's working, what's not working, what do we like, not like, what can we do better, which are all valuable uh, parts of the conversation, but to reframe now the discussion into what's the change that we wanna see, and then how do we get there as the Africa Evidence Network? Uh, within this entity in which we all share space and, and common objectives uh, and a diversity of, of how we go about it. How do we use the network to decide what should be our priorities out of all of the things that we could be focusing on? And how can the network uh, have a voice as an advocate more widely uh, and outside the network to be able to take these messages to um, donors and others and other stakeholders to keep the conversation going and, and to build momentum so that we actually go beyond conversation and we get change. So from, from, from discussion to action, conversation uh, to change. And we'd really love to start to hear ideas about how um, we can rethink in, in new and exciting ways if, if we're going to put on the next uh, evidence conference, what are, what are new ways that we could be organizing ourselves that can take us to, into new spaces and ways that we can interact and learn from each other and go away energized in new and different ways uh, from the approaches to the conference planning that we've been using in the past. So if everybody can see the slide, We've summarized uh, some of these uh, starting questions. And I think, Suziwe, over to you now to moderate um, the, the uh, inputs from, from the participants. 
Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Beryl and Ruth, for your presentation. So now will be the time to start a discussion with the group. So what we'll do, um, members that are attending the webinar, you uh, mute yourself and contribute, and then the next person will do the same. So I'll also unmute you from my side. So we have one person um, talking at a go, so that you can be able to hear you as a person talking. So over to the audience, anyone who'd like to go first to give their input. And yeah, and unmute you. If you would need to give us an in input, please unmute yourself so that you can um, give us your input. Input. Thank you very much. It's time for group discussion. Anyone would like to go first, or even if you have a question or any input in terms of the, the, the presentations that have been made by the two speakers. If you are unclear of something, you can ask a question and then also I'll give you input because we, are, we would like to really um, hear from you as well as you are part of this um, uh, webinar and discussion. Okay, um, hello. Hello, go hello. ahead. Yeah, um, my name is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Kahurani from African Institute for Development Policy, AFIDEP. Um, I like, uh, I really like the presentation and I like what was said uh, regarding uh, the process of policy evidence being a right to everyone and not just policy makers and that we need to get uh, the evidence in the hands of citizens as well. And so it would be good for us to explore maybe in the conference effective ways of engaging the public uh, with the, uh, on, on the evidence making process and how they can use that evidence to hold uh, their leaders accountable uh, when it comes to governance. Thank you very much for your input. Um, anyone else who would like to give their input? Because I think as uh, Africa Evidence Network, we have this platform for us to be able to share ideas and also be able to meet the needs of our members. So with us being in the time and period where we're trying to plan Evidence 2020, so it would be great to um, have people share their ideas, also based in terms of the experience that you had if you attended Evidence 2018. What were your experiences there? What would you like us to take um, to Evidence 2020? That would be great for you to share with us. I see, Karina, you are up. Please go ahead. Um, thanks, Mr. Ben. Thanks, Ruth and Beryl. Um, I really like the thinking that you um, you hinted at to reshape evidence 2020 as a learning event. Um, I think part of the difficulty for me to kind of think with, but how do we do that? It's partly wondering, um, as the ADN, do we have a sense of what are the capacity needs of our members? I mean, do we know that, you know, Karina wants to uh, expand her capacity in this particular the area. I mean, do we have a sense of, of that from, from AEN members? Um, I think Ruth and I will try and um, answer this. I think because annually we do a member survey. So issues around capacity came out a lot in 2018. Members saying we want to um, have capacity sharing opportunities or we want to be trained by AEN. And we realized that as AEN, we won't be able to train all our members. As a result, um, just to kickstart this process, we thought let's do um, the database 
that will sort of list all the capacity sharing activities across the continent so people can select where they could go and attend these sessions. And secondly, we are having this webinar also just to put fillers out there to say what is the best way to, to go about doing capacity sharing to make sure that our members benefit from um, something like this. So as AEN, we're putting a lot of thought into it. So we're going to have a lot of consultation processes that we're going to be doing. We're going to be testing different um, pieces of work. For example, this webinar, and also we put out a blog around this particular issue. And also we're going to have a capacity sharing um, session at AFRIA in next month. So we're trying to see what is the best way um, to um, respond to our members' um, needs in terms of capacity sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suziwe. So if I can jump in, I think there's also um, a challenge to your question, which is uh, a little assuming that a learning event is about um, focusing on providing capacity development to meet specific needs. But if we were to assume that rather than um, some participants coming and wanting training or workshops, instead everybody who comes helps us to understand the evidence ecosystem and to make it work better. What if we had a conference where we don't have any PowerPoint presentations, we ban them? What if instead when we register for the conference as part of our bio, we have to state the kind of expertise and experience that we bring, that we could share, and the kind of expertise and experience that we have no idea about. So that um, people come aware of who else is there and what they're bringing and how they might share. And that we do some kind of uh, matchmaking and sharing discussion. What if every participant was told to please practice an elevator pitch? based on um, the expertise that they have within the ecosystem. And we had lots of slots during the conference where people are asked, stand up. OK, we've got five minutes. Let's have five elevator pitches from different people around the room so that we can get to know the expertise in the room. And those are just kind of a couple of wacky ideas. I'd love to hear what other wacky alternative, maybe I shouldn't say wacky, that makes it sound a bit crazy, <laughs> but alternative ideas for meeting the needs you're, you're hinting at, Karina. Uh, how, how do we do capacity sharing at a conference in new ways so that we can really focus on the sharing part? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ruth. I saw Gordon, you were up. Please go ahead. All right, thank you. This is Gordon from uh, Evaluation Search of Kenya. All right, for me, uh, I will want to see more of uh, unpacking of uh, evidence, eh? because sometimes uh, when you talk about evidence, I don't know whether we are all on the same page on exactly what we mean, eh? but uh, I will be interested in us uh, focusing a little bit more on unpacking evidence because as you know if you want to use uh, you know evidence for decision making uh, is quite or is more of like a process because uh, you start with the data uh, data collection or data generation or data gathering and we all know that you know when data is, uh, is, is is processed and maybe analyzed you get information and uh, if that information is interpreted uh, uh, then you get some kind of knowledge yeah? and when that knowledge you, you know that knowledge can now be used to make decisions yeah? as, as evidence yeah? so is there a way we can maybe look at the capacity issues and maybe focus on the entire spectrum of evidence that is uh, uh, data gathering or data collection quality data we all know that garbage in garbage out uh, that is data collection how can we focus uh, on uh, on translation of information into knowledge and then uh, uh, from knowledge into you know what we call wisdom uh, or use of knowledge uh, for decision making as part of evidence so that entire spectrum so that we have uh, uh, the right capacity in every component of the entire spectrum of evidence thank you thank you very much Gordon for your inputs and I think towards the end of the also the, the, the webinar, the two speakers will have an opportunity to sort of have their closing remarks. So at the moment, we're still giving the participants to give their input. I saw Elizabeth, you you unmuted yourself. You wanted to give a comment. Can you please go ahead? 
My name is Elizabeth, I'm from Uganda, and uh, I wanted to uh, give this submission. Uh, I believe there are islands of evidence in the different, within the different stakeholders, the public sector, private sector, CSOs, think tanks. Um, however, the challenge is usually how do they all bring together this evidence so that it can be tapped into by everyone, as you rightly put it, making it a right for everyone to access the evidence. So for me, I think what um, the evidence conference could also look at is a way of holding hands, a way of bringing those that have been able to have um, evidence brought in one space where everyone can be able to tap into, to showcase and show everyone else how they are doing it so that uh, lessons are then taken by the different um, participants, by the different countries that attend, by the different uh, stakeholders in the evidence um, uh, arena. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for your input. Um, anyone else who'd like to give their inputs? If you need to give your inputs, please um, unmute yourself so that you can be able to get an opportunity um, to say something. I think in the meantime, we're looking for maybe if someone is still gathering their thoughts to say what they would like to share with us. Maybe Ruth, is there anything you'd like to share in terms of Gordon and Elizabeth's inputs that they've just shared with us? Thank you, Suziwe, and thank you, colleagues, for sharing your ideas. Um, I think you both, uh, those last two comments, uh, make very good points around the fact that there, we often talk about evidence, but we don't often unpack what we mean by it. And I think being moving those conversations forwards and being more explicit about, in any one conversation, what we mean about evidence, and indeed trying to map out, as you were saying, Gordon, the full spectrum of uh, different types of evidence um, would be a really nice idea and we can think about how that kind of uh, concept could be unpacked more in these discussions both around capacity development because what do we mean when we think about capacity development for evidence if we don't say what we mean by evidence then it's very difficult to think about what we mean by capacity um, and uh, these these silos um, Elizabeth thank you for that comment are, are a real issue and people have evidence across um, different sectors and in different filing cabinets, let alone uh, different types of organizations, as you were saying, private sector, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that there are some quite innovative ideas of trying to bridge those gaps. And we should think a little bit around how to share that innovation um, with one another in this kind of capacity sharing forum, um, but also whether or not the Evidence 2020 itself couldn't be a sharing forum to think about uh, the different uh, pools of evidence, islands of evidence, you call them, um, and how we can bring them together into one space. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, Beryl, do you have anything to add to this discussion? Uh, yeah. uh, yes, I, I'd like to thank uh, the people who have um, given comments because it, it already has sparked uh, new thoughts that, uh, you know, that I, I came into this and I, and I had preconceived notions about, about certain ways, but uh, thanks to the, to the comments. Um, I just had two ideas that I wanted to throw out uh, that sort of riff on uh, what's been mentioned, not to do anything other than put it on the table and say, oh, you know, I'd like to know if this resonates with people. And I, I want to give a caveat. My caveat is that I, I tend to be one of those conference goers that can be very content to sit and listen. That uh, there's the activist side of me, but somehow when I go to a conference, I just kind of go into a more passive uh, role and I, I very much enjoy listening and learning. And I get a little intimidated by this idea of, oh my goodness, I'm going into a session where I'm gonna have to um, get up and do something, you know, and uh, write on flip charts and all that, even though it always goes well, I'm always a bit uh, 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 hesitant uh, to start. So that's the type of conference goer I am. But the, I, one of my ideas, I have two, two ideas to share. One is based on this, uh, you know, sort of what do we mean by evidence? But my challenge in this is, how to have a discussion about what is evidence without it being sort of pedantic or 
you know, uh, these these long debates that we have. I, I come from you know gender equality debates over the years, and we debate and debate and debate. What do we mean by gender? And, and never, you know, it's complex, so it doesn't get resolved. But one of the ways that we might want to organize it or could is this idea of there's a life cycle of evidence where we would make sure that we highlighted the different types. So for example, when I said to myself, scratching notes, well, what, where would I start my life cycle? I started it with people, not with data. I started with people in a context. And the fact that a lot of data that we collect is about people's knowledge of a situation and experience, how to solve a problem, the context in which uh, an issue is happening, all of that. And taking through an, a guided discussion of everybody about at each of these stages, what is, what is evidence at this stage and why is it evidence and what do we do with it when it's at the data stage? And what are the various ways that we've learned in research uh, to collect data and what are the, uh, the benefits of doing it that way? Right through to what we usually focus on in evidence use too much is how do you take evidence that you think is good evidence and you try to use it to influence a change uh, by power holders or, or, or a group that you have targeted to say, I'm going to use evidence to help me win my arguments about why something needs to change. So that we start to value uh, how evidence comes into being, how power affects it, how at certain stages, right from the beginning, certain people are excluded from both the discussions about what counts for evidence and also access to and use of evidence that's being produced about them. This is a big problem we have in the research cycle. The other idea that I would uh, throw out is an idea of role playing. And I'm keying off this idea that it's too simplistic to say Ruth is a producer, Gordon is a user, Elizabeth is a, is a uh, knowledge broker, let's say, right? And that somehow we neatly play our roles in the evidence ecosystem in certain ways because of those labels. One of the lessons out of B-Cure was the fact that we shouldn't have these binaries, that at different times for different reasons, producers are users. We all, to be effective, actually our knowledge, we are knowledge translators. It, it may be something we don't do all the time or have specialists who help us with it, but nobody gets to not be a good knowledge translator and have anybody understand and value the evidence that we're producing and using. So we all need to value that we are all doing that to one level or another. But if we created scenarios where groups went in, and if I'm a researcher, I would become a policymaker, okay, or something like that, and that for a half a day, we worked on problem solving and scenario building using evidence as that group in this role playing and then report out what we learned about each other and about the process and how we would do things differently because we had interacted and discussed what we were doing. So those were two ideas to go back to um, the question of, well, what would a, a learning event look like? And those might be horrible ideas, but they're just two that came to mind uh, as everybody was talking. So I thought I'd toss them in. Thank you very much, Bera, um, for that um, input. Um, I think um, attendees, um, you just need, I think I saw some new people that have just joined us. Um, if you want to give your input in, in relation to the topic, please unmute yourself and then be able to give your input. Hi, this is Nasreen. Is it okay for me to go ahead? Yes, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, fascinating conversation um, and great ideas. And it kind of struck me that it, I was reflecting a little bit on the International Conference on Family Planning that I went to in Kigali last year. And I'm wondering to what extent we can learn a little bit from that conference in terms of the power of storytelling. And maybe, you know, research to policy doesn't create as many exciting stories as perhaps the experience of childbirth or contraception or um, stigmas and biases might. But perhaps um, to get innovative, we could think perhaps about asking 
that abstract submission be the equivalent of a script of a monologue or a script of a dialogue or a role play um, as one way of thinking about how can we present differently about an experience where evidence has um, played a role in decision making, either at the priority setting stage, at the community level, at a um, policy level, whatever it may be, and that um, those kind of abstracts give researchers in some ways a different kind of challenge as to how to convey um, an experience, but also that it would be presented in that way. And we can think about plenaries perhaps being um, more like stories um, or storytelling rather than the presentations that we're, we're used to. And this goes to Ruth's point about should we be banning the PowerPoint presentation. At the same time, people do need to submit abstracts for which they can justify attendance at a conference. So I was thinking, and a little bit of, of you know a springboard off of what Beryl was saying, you know, in terms of could could this then look like role plays um, or scenarios where people change the perspective from which they're used to seeing um, these kind of opportunities play out, and maybe that could be something to to think about at the plenary stage, at the workshop stage, but also at the abstract stage in terms of how to present um, you know scripts or dialogues or monologues, for example. Um, thank you very much for, for this input. I think we are taking notes. So um, I think it's, I'm trying to take three inputs at a time so that we see if our speakers can also um, share some insights for that. Um, is there anyone else who would like to share um, their inputs or contribution? Okay, I thought you, maybe Ruth, do you would like to share something in terms of what Nazreen was sharing? Uh, so thank um, you. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say another wacky idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go for it. No, I think that's what I should have started off with. <laughs> Over to you, Ruth. She's always a bit disjointed. Um, so uh, really just to say thank you, and I think that's exactly the kind of rethinking that we want to have. And that in order to work out what are the right approaches or the best approaches or the most practical ones and the ways of engaging people, we need lots of ideas and then we can filter through them and share them and mull them over. Um, I know that some of my colleagues who were, at, uh, who were in Australia for the Global Evidence Summit at the end of last year came back talking about evidence storytelling. And it's language that we're starting to use um, both at the Africa Center for Evidence and as part of the Africa Evidence Network. So I like the storytelling and dialogue idea. Um, it also has a nice tradition within the continent. So it has um, it, it rings true as maybe a more um, made in Africa approach than some of those conference traditions that we tend to religiously follow without really thinking through. Um, so thank you. I, I like it and I'd love to hear more. I just wanted to um, raise one other thing, which is that we're looking at Evidence 2020 as a, a, a conference, a learning event, and a, a, a few days in September in 2020. But we're also hoping that we can build a dialogue from now and onwards. So this is one of many discussions that we're hoping to facilitate and move these discussions along. So it might be interesting to also hear whether there are particular ways in which participants in this webinar um, would like those conversations to build so that when we get together in September 2020, we're not um, just picking up on what was said in Evidence 2018, but actually we're, we're building on an ongoing dialogue that moves forwards steadily over the period. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Ruth, for, for that uh, input and question just to stimulate the discussion. Um, I've noticed that Emmanuel just joined us. So do you have an input to share? Because I just saw your message. Please self-unmute so that you can be able to um, share. It's a bit noisy here. There we go. Um, I don't know. Looking at... Um, what we have in view. Uh, I don't know if uh, global health security is considered as either a theme 
for thematic discussion or a panel or a plenary. So um, considering the uh, health status or the health uh, infrastructural systems in Africa, it would be good to consider global health security agenda or global health security so that at um, the e AEN we are able to uh, discuss it further. That would just be my input. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, for, for that input. I think Ruth has some thoughts in terms of um, that point that you've just raised. Thank you, and thank you, Emmanuel, for that. I think, um, for me, the slightly broader picture that you're raising is that we're talking about evidence and evidence use for decision making, but we don't want to do that in an entirely abstract way. We do need to think about what priorities, evidence for what and decisions about what and priorities around our continent, and some of which are particularly pressing. And your, your point about biosecurity, I think, is, is one of those that is up at the top of that list. So in thinking around the conference, we do need to balance this between the kind of uh, more general discussions about evidence and how it's used, and actually the more applied issues about you know, real priorities that are facing people on the ground all the time. So thank you, Emmanuel, for, for that reminder that we need to keep these really um, life and death scenarios and real kind of priority issues for the continent at the forefront of our discussions as well. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, Hello? I... Hello. Please go ahead. Uh, this is Enoch. Go ahead, Enoch. Yeah, I think I joined the meeting a little bit uh, late, but uh, what I just want to highlight is to to appreciate to appreciate the um, the importance of these regular webinars, and uh, also in our reference group meeting end of last year, I also proposed that maybe if we can have special thematic areas where we can say a thematic area for health, thematic area for uh, this special area, thematic area into this, so that in terms of pushing the evidence, uh, use of evidence in terms of policy making, uh, it can be maybe pushed along those uh, special thematic area if it's feasible, obvious. Definitely, maybe there will be challenges in terms of the personnel and the groups that will form those special thematic area. Because, for example, I'm from the health sector, and if we're going to look deeper into the ways in which we can push the agenda in terms of use of evidence, generating evidence. Have you finished, Enoch? Sorry, there was a bit of noise um, in the background whilst you were talking. Hello. You concluded your comment? Okay, I think I had been disconnected briefly. So I think I can. Are you, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, I was just saying some of the issues we had highlighted in the reference group meeting end of last year. Maybe just to see possibility of having special thematic areas, health, public health, uh, whether climate change or any areas that probably the African network is going to be focusing on. That can also assist in terms of looking uh, from an in-depth point of view and see how best you can policy influence uh, those areas. Uh, how can sorry evidence influence policy making advocates with policymakers, politicians, governments? And other key actors as far as policy making is concerned. I think those are my contributions. I joined a little bit earlier, but thank you for hosting the webinar and looking forward for more to come as we continue to interact. Um, thank you very much, uh, Enoch, for your input and also you know the interest in the in the work that AEN is doing. I would like just to go to Beryl. Maybe she has a comment in terms of uh, maybe the two or three uh, inputs that were given. Beryl, over to you. Um, I think all of these ideas are, are just fantastic, that we can build on them and will help us frame uh, 
the next uh, rounds of discussions. Uh, it will definitely inform the conversations that we have at Afreya in in a few weeks. Uh, I I can't underscore enough the uh, the point about store the importance of storytelling. We we often when we're uh, doing uh, training on um, using making uh, producing effective policy briefs, uh, and when I'm working with researchers, the 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 fact is, is that in a world that's driven, that's evidence driven uh, by nature, there's an idea that that it's about knowing the most technically, and um, and having credibility because you know you're good at math and you can do all this complicated stuff and your research is just really fantastic and was published in all the right journals and as Ruth said, you know it went to the right schools, but power power to change is is inherent in the power of the storytelling. And the storytelling is about making whatever is going on that you want to make better a story about human beings. And that time and again, when we're talking about a promoting evidence use with decision makers, which is where we spend a lot of time and effort, that we think that we have to impress these power holders. And in fact, uh, we are more successful oftentimes when we relate to what matters to their constituencies if they're elected. Um, and that we identify with who they are as people, that they have partners, that they have children, uh, that they live in communities, and to relate to the evidence uh, along those lines. So I, I think that's a great sort of human focus um, for us to keep in mind through everything that we're talking about. And this idea about themes, and, um, and, and I think in terms of what should we be advocating for, this idea of of framing evidence use not in the abstract, but around what are the timely um, uh, issues that where people want to know how to, to make something better and how do we frame what we're saying about using evidence use better around what those issues are. Um, and perhaps AEN will need to think in terms of maybe more localized approaches rather than regional approaches. That's something that we can keep discussing. Um, so there's just so much there, and it's wonderful. And and um, and I'm I think having these webinars is so much better than trying to just have these once every six months or once a year workshop sessions uh, at big conferences. Not that it should be an either or, but clearly. Um, AEN is on to a winning formula to be having members gather and, and discuss these matters together. So I think that's it for me. Um, and, and thanks to everyone and wonderful hosting. And this is my first AEN webinar and, and, uh, and I can't wait to have a chance to join the, the next one. Um, thank you very much, uh, Bera. Um, I think our hour is finished, and I think that they, there's still so much to be discussed around this topic around capacity sharing. So I think um, to, I think tomorrow the, the, the video has been taken for the webinar, and it will be uploaded to Africa Evidence Network website. So let's continue this conversation because we don't want it to end now. Maybe people have ideas that they want to share with us. Please continue um, these conversations in the um using our platforms you can send us an email at ace at uj.ac.za and also you can go to our website and also our social media pages to also um share with us so let's have this conversation on an ongoing basis so that we have um all your input members that have attended this particular webinar and also please check out the blog around this particular topic I think it will also give you more information because the presentation was a shorter version of what is in the blog. Also look at, the, at that and, and share with us. So thank you very much everyone for attending our webinar. Looking forward to seeing you in our next thank webinar. You. Thank you very much. The webinar has been adjourned. Thank you.